information. It's wild. And so today, in just a few moments here, we're gonna open up the book to Matthew chapter four. That's where we'll start. And then we'll be kind of hitting a lot of different scriptures. Um, But before I jump into the word, I do want to throw a graphic on the screen. So if you're in the back, can you throw the discipleship pathway graphic on the screen? I want you all to see this before I get into my message because I want you to identify where you're at in the journey. Now, here's what I'll tell you. Not everybody's process is the same. But this graphic is a really good picture of the idea of, of where you may be. And so this first section at the top is, is our community. And in that community, there are people far from God and that are not at Love Church. And God is sending you all into the community to reach them. And then through your invitation or through your opportunity of sharing the gospel with them, they come to a place of being surrendered. Salvation's going to be extended here at the end of our worship encounter. Then you've got this piece of being surrounded, surrounded in a small group or on a serve team, engaging in being spirit led and self fed and you're engaging in the daily reading and one to one discipleship. And then the goal here is that you would experience God's best for your life. And this is living the five S life. What's the five S life? You're surrendered. You're surrounded, you're spirit-led, you're self-fed, and you're sent. That's the heart of this church. I mean, our motivation is that you would experience God's best for your life. Our mission is that you would love God supremely and love people supernaturally. The method or how we do that is through the five S's. This is not a one-time thing. This is a daily thing that we need to come back to. And so when you look at this, I want you to consider like, where are you at on the discipleship pathway? Because I can tell you this much, we are so grateful and thankful for every single person that walks through these doors on a Sunday morning. But must you understand that our heart is for you to continue to go on a journey. We just believe that we experience God's best when we begin to engage in the community and the mission of the local church. God said he's gonna build one thing and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And the one thing he said he was gonna build is the local church. This is God's plan A, and he's called all of us to be a part of it. It's not going to happen with just a few of us. It's going to happen when we all begin to engage. You're going to find out in this message that God's heart for you is to be a disciple and make disciples. And so the question is, is where are we at in that process? So I'm going to pray, and I just want you to even just consider that today. There's no shaming in this. I simply believe Jesus sent me here today to give you and I an invitation for the next step in our journey, considering the current season we're in and the the season that he's inviting us into. So let's go to him in prayer. Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity to get in the game, to be a part of this thing. And we know that in this room, we're all at different places in the journey. And I pray that you would stretch all of us, that we would not come to the word of God today with our preconceived notions or ideas or, oh, here we go again, another get in the game message or whatever the case is, but we would come before you today humbly saying, God, move in our hearts. Do a new thing. Holy Spirit, we know that this isn't something that can be mustered up in our own strength, so we just, we just ask you to begin moving. You're right in the center of every single thing that we just put on that discipleship pathway. And so we just ask you to move over our next few moments here and receive the glory in Jesus' name. Come on, if you believe it, say amen. As I was preparing for this special get in the game message, which is the title of today's message, if you're a note taker, I was brought all the way back to 2006. Now, for many of you, this story is going to be a little bit redundant, but I know there's some folks in the room that don't know my story. In 2006, I began my freshman year at Iowa State University, and for some context, uh, I was a walk-on on the football team, you know, got dressed in the visitor's locker room, carried a little egg crate to the center of the locker room on game day. I was one of 10 guys with no name on the back of my jersey, and every Wednesday when all the redshirt freshmen would lift, uh, I had to stay in my dorm room, and when I did get the chance to lift, they would put me in the corner with a, 
with a wooden stick. They'd have me do like squats with the stick and push-ups. If I'm really honest, I just felt like I didn't belong. I definitely didn't feel like I was wanted in that particular season. And, you know, to, to, to add fuel to the fire, I had been in a relationship in high school for four years. And then in that first semester, my girlfriend dumped me. And like a week later, I show up to the parking lot. My car had been broken into. All my subs were taken. And all of a sudden, Ames, Iowa turned into Lames, Iowa real quick. I remember this season. I remember feeling so alone. Have you ever felt that way? Like maybe you didn't play Division I athletics or maybe your season of loneliness wasn't when you were in college, but maybe right now you're sitting in your chair and if I really got to the root of your heart right now and I asked you how you were really doing, not, not the mask that you put on when you come in here or the facade, but I'm asking you how you're really doing. You would say, I feel lonely. I read a statistic recently that said that 35% of adults struggle with chronic loneliness. There's another stat that says that only 8% of adults had a conversation with their neighbor in the last year. I mean, it's crazy, and I get it. I live in West Omaha. It's, 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 it's funny because I've got little kids that wanna play outside. So they're out there riding bikes, and a lot of my neighbors come home, they pull in their garage, and before they even get out of the car, and there's no shame in this, they already are shutting the garage door from their vehicle. I'm like, man, nobody wants to engage. Nobody wants to interact. And that's our culture right now. The most connected that we've ever been, but for some reason, loneliness is skyrocketing. It doesn't make sense. I mean, you and I, we pull open our phones and we are more connected than we've ever been, but loneliness is on the rise. Something just doesn't add up when I think about that equation. But how many of you know that connectivity and community are two different things? Community is at the heart of God. Relationship is what Jesus invites us into. And for so long, we've, we've adopted this, individ, this hyper-individualism perspective that my faith is personal. It's just me and Jesus. All I need is Jesus. I don't need community. I don't need people. And I'm just here to tell you that I don't see that in the way that Jesus operated in his own ministry. The very thing that he built with his disciples was community. What's interesting when you think about the idea of community and transformation is a lot of the discipleship that is set up in the Western church is targeted towards the left brain. It's read your Bible. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's real, it, it, it hits these like more task-oriented things. Well, the right side of your brain is the more emotional side. The only way that you're, the right side of your brain is really activated in this discipleship process is in relationship. You know what's funny is I was studying this and reading about the brain and trying to unpack all this, and I started to just think about my own experience. A couple Thursdays ago, we're sitting in a small group. I lead a small group on, on Thursdays with Matt Jackson right here in the front row. And we're sitting in our group and in this particular week and in this particular season, if I'm just really vulnerable with the church, there's seasons where I'm like, is this whole ministry thing for me? Like, am I, am I really called to this? Should I go do something different? What I've learned in this journey is God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. And you know what's interesting is we all struggle with those sorts of insecurities and thoughts in our life, and you're not alone in that. There's something powerful even in our vulnerability and I'm being vulnerable before you that I don't just get up here and feel like, feel like it every time. Answering God's call, it requires us to surrender our will to him, to give him lordship, to say, God, I don't feel like going on the stage right now and preaching. I feel like running out the back door, but I'm going to obey you because you're my Lord. 
See, we've got weakened wills in our culture, and we need to strengthen our wills, and that happens in community and relationship. So a couple Thursdays ago, we're sitting in our group, and this young man just begins to divulge the season of life that he's walking through. And when he begins to unpack what he's going through, and I won't unpack it in here, my jaw about hit the floor. I was so blown away by this young man's humility and vulnerability. And as he got vulnerable with the group, you just saw, you saw everything that I'm trying to describe to you. That like, you, it, There's no data. There's no metric to be able to measure it. You've just got to experience it. And all of a sudden, I'm looking around the room, and there are tears coming down grown men's faces because of how vulnerable this guy is getting. And next thing you know, our group is laying hands on this man and praying for him and encouraging him. And I'm watching guys in the group rise up in their gift sets, and words of prophecy are being spoken over this man. And I'm in the back of the room just kind of pacing. And I get out of this meeting, and I text my friend Matt, and I just said, man, would we never forget the privilege that Jesus has invited us into to be a part of? It's like all of a sudden I got perspective for the very thing that Jesus has called me to. I walked out of that meeting with my empathy had, having risen up. And in a culture when empathy, when everything is going in the opposite direction of empathy, it's actually in community, a vulnerable community where we experience empathy. So instead of being the church, that's getting our iPhones out and recording the chaos, we're actually the ones going in and rescuing in the midst of chaos. See, empathy is what is built up in community. And I just believe that this is at the heart of our good, good God. Jesus modeled it. And so today I'm gonna get excited and I'm probably gonna coach you and I don't have enough time to unpack all the various ways that you can engage in the mission of Love Church. I'm gonna try to do my best in a few short moments. But in these particular areas, I could go so much deeper into God's heart, and I wish I could. But this is gonna be like a 30,000 foot view perspective on what God's next step could be for you in this season. Now, here's what I wanna tell you is that you're gonna hear me probably get excited and passionate because I wanna see you experience God's best for your life, but I imagine that the next step that the Holy Spirit wants you to take is gonna come in the form of a small whisper. So I want you to open your heart to him even in this moment. I want you to posture yourself in a place of humility to say, Jesus, I wanna be stretched. I wanna, I wanna experience your best for my life. I wanna lean in, I wanna be stretched. And so let's go to Matthew chapter four. You're gonna see how Jesus, I mean, just the, the way that he invites us into the more. It's not a sales pitch. It's not a guilt trip. He's, you don't hear, it's not like preachy. At least that's not how it reads. It's just a genuine invitation for the more. And I just believe that's what the Holy Spirit's doing here today. He's a gentleman saying, do you want the more or do you not? I'm not gonna coerce you. I'm not gonna guilt you. I'm not gonna shame you. But do you want the more for your life? So let's check this out. Matthew chapter four, verse 18. It says this. One day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter and Andrew, throwing a net into the water for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, come follow me and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little farther up the shore, he saw two other brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat with their father Zebedee, repairing their nets, and he called them to come, too. They immediately followed him, leaving the boat and their father behind. So this is the book of Matthew. It's one of the accounts of Jesus' life. This is the gospel according to Matthew. And in this particular scripture, Jesus is inviting these four men to follow him. And he says that I will make you fishers of men. So I think it's important that before we move any further, we've got to define what the game is. If we're asking you to get into the game, what is the game? There's a lot of things that Jesus calls us to, but really the game is to be discipled and make a disciple, to follow and to fish 
to be discipled by Jesus and in community and to make disciples. That's really the crux of what he's called us to. Now, there's a number of other things that he says within the scriptures, like he gives us a command within that to love him and love people, right? But this is what Jesus is calling them to. He's inviting them into the game with him. He's saying, come be an apprentice with me. Come learn from me. There's no pressure. I'm not gonna give you a sales pitch or guilt you, but I want you to follow me. Now, when he's asking them to follow, the invitation is not as an individual, but he's inviting them into what? To live in community. Do you see here? He's calling disciples, plural, now, I know what some of you are thinking right now. You're thinking, okay, I know where he's going with this. He's describing the game, and eventually he's gonna give me the pitch to join a group. Well, I feel extremely uncomfortable meeting new people, or I've never fit within church culture. I just, I don't wanna do that. I don't wanna go sit around and talk about the Bible, or I just don't feel like I'm qualified for that, or that I belong. Turn over to Matthew 9. I want you to see this. It says this in verse 9. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his tax collector's booth. Now, you need to know this, that tax collectors were despised in this culture. They were actually in partnership with, with Rome, with the Romans who were in control. Now, you know this about God's people. They thought that they, the Messiah would rise up and overthrow the Roman government. So look at this. Jesus sees Matthew who's sitting at the tax collector's booth and he says this, follow me and be my disciple. It's funny because I talk to people and there's some people that I invite to church and they're like, dude, if I walked into your church, the, the church would, would burn on fire. And there's some of you that you probably even think that. You're like, dude, if you knew what I did. Well, look at this right here. Jesus according to Matthew chapter nine, is inviting these people to come follow him, to be his disciple. So Matthew gets up and what's he do? He follows him. Later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. Ooh, Jesus is eating with sinners. Oh, I saw you hanging out with that guy at Panera, man. You better watch yourself. But when the Pharisees saw this, they asked the disciples, why does your teacher eat with such scum? When Jesus heard this, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. Jesus didn't come to make the bad good. He came to make dead people alive. So whether you're like a pro sinner or amateur sinner, you need Jesus. <laughs> Just the facts. Then he added, now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not other sacrifices, for I've come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. So why am I reading these, these scriptures at the jump here? Is because I want to address what I feel like are some of the stumbling blocks for you jumping into community. I think first and foremost, some of us were like, oh, I'm an outlaw, or Maybe you're in this place and you feel more like you're overlooked. What I want you to see here is Jesus is inviting these disciples onto his team and it's those that were overlooked and those that were outlaws. So if you feel that way, you're in good company. I mean, just some context here for the first group of guys that were fishermen, you have to recognize that in Jewish culture, when a boy was 12, he would go before the rabbi. The rabbi would school him or... or or basically quiz him in the Torah, and then that rabbi would make a decision based on that young boy's potential on whether he was gonna actually ask him to be his disciple or, in most cases, ask him to go pick up his father's trade. So you gotta understand that these fishermen that he's calling were overlooked by the rabbis of the day. And Jesus is saying, come with me, I choose you. You might have been overlooked by the religious people, but come be on my squad and come be a part of this apprenticeship. Then he goes to Matthew and all the, the, the religious snubs of the day are like crossing their arms at Jesus and Jesus is like, yo, come be on my squad. So here's what I want to say at the onslaught is if, you're, if you've got all these different things that are going through your, your, your mind, all these different excuses or these insecurities on why you shouldn't engage in community, let me, let me tell you, you're in good company. I, I don't know why this happens in church. 
But for some reason, we feel like we've just got to have it all buttoned up. Jesus said it himself. I came for sick people. This place should look more like a hospital than a museum. So why are we surprised when we engage in community and it's messy? It's where transformation happens, vulnerability, accountability, embracing the messiness. And guess what? Some of you, you actually took the shot. You got into community. It got a little bit messy, and now you're wanting to run. My challenge to you today is stay in there because there's transformation in the midst of the mess. The mess will become, the mess will become your message if you will stick to it. And so I see these things that are prohibiting people from in our culture from really embracing the heart of God in these particular areas. And the first one, I touched on it a minute ago, is it's individualism. I got this. This is my life. You just do you. Finish the line with me. I'm a do. You do you. I'm a do, do me. We're, we're, we're in a culture where it's very non-committal. That's why we're seeing less people get married. Uh, I just don't, I don't want to commit to anything. I just want to just do me. Do me. So I don't want to commit to community because if I commit to community, I'm coming under the authority of the word of God and under the authority of the community. But there's blessing in that. God has set it up that way. The second thing that I see is like a, is a trap or the thing that's blocking people from leaning in is what I would call idealism. This is unrealistic expectations. I see this in so many young people, especially those that are still praying for their spouse. They're like on the search for the perfect man or woman. Oh, I'm gonna find them. And so they jump from relationship to relationship only to realize that there's nobody it's perfect. Can I get an amen? All the married people are like, yeah. But it's like in this, in this desire for idealism, we're looking for the perfect community. So the same thing happens in the church. We jump from one church to the next because I'm looking for this thing that's perfect. There's no perfect community. Guess what? Last time I checked, churches are full of people, and we all stinky sinners. We're all messed up, jacked up. Come on, let's stop acting like we got it together. We're saved by the grace of God, redeemed new creations, and the Holy Spirit's in us. We are new people, but come on, somebody. It is a messy community. And last time I checked, and I thought about this, is the people closest to me, the people I'm most intimate with are the ones that are hurt by me the most. It's because they get the real me. So when I'm at home, I'm not putting up a facade. So my daughter catches me every once in a while raising my voice at her. I was in the car the other night just saying, hey, Judah, Journey, what's one way that daddy could love you a little bit better? My son's like, nothing, dad. <laughs> You're good. I'm like, Journey, baby, what's one way that I could love you a little bit better? She's like, Daddy, you know, sometimes you raise your voice, and could you just work on that? I'm like, oh, thank you, baby. That's so good. <laughs> but isn't it true? That's what I mean about the power of vulnerability and intimacy, and that's where real growth can actually take place because I'm bringing the real version of who I am. And so we see, we see this. We see individualism, idealism. The third one would be just intimidation. We're fearful. We're believing the lie that we don't belong or no one's gonna like me. I'm not gonna fit in. Our insecurities speak way louder than what we could actually receive from the particular community. And these fears are what prohibit us from taking a next step. But here's what I want us to understand is no matter where you're at in this process, we all have to make a decision today to drop the nets if we're gonna follow after Jesus. So I don't know what you're holding on to or what the thing is that stands in the way of you stepping into this new season or the new thing that God has for you, but you're gonna have to let that thing go if you're gonna embrace the new. You've gotta let go of the old thing to pick up the new thing. You've gotta turn from one thing so that you can receive the next thing. Is anybody with me today? There's nobody that can do that for you and I except you and I. 
I wish I could tell you something different. But we need to ask the Holy Spirit to give us the courage to let go. And there's promise in it. Check this out in Matthew chapter 10. I want you to see this. This is such a good verse of scripture. And it says this, if you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. Let that sink in for a second. If you hold on to this thing, if you cling to it, you could potentially lose your purpose, your destiny, and the beautiful plan that God has for you. Not one that doesn't have trial or tribulation, but the beautiful life that we have in obedience. But if you release it, if you, if you give it up, you will find life. So, so what am I really trying to say to us, church? And this is where I'm gonna get a little excited. Is that there's more to life. Do you wanna experience God's best? Do you believe that he has more for you? Do you wanna lean in in this season and receive all that he has for you? Do you believe that there are people in this church to be discipled? Do you believe that God wants to call you to be a discipler? Do you believe that there's a place for you on the bus, a camera to get on, a soundboard to run, a song to sing? Come on, right now over here in the Love Kids area, we got the next generation of leaders that are being raised up in the word of God. We're not babysitting, we're raising up leaders. Come on, there's a place for you on the bus. Do you wanna welcome people as they walk into the doors and before they ever hear a word out of a preacher's mouth, they are embraced with a hug? There is a place for you on this bus. There is more. There is a community to reach. Is anybody with me? There is a region to reach. There is a world to reach and his... The way he's going to do it is through you and I. Do you believe it? But it's going to require us to do three things. I want to give them to you. Number one is we need to be growing. 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 So what I want to say about this is today when I talk about this idea of growing, I am focusing on com the community aspect of growth, getting surrounded in a small group. Today is small group launch Sunday. Get in the game. Afterwards, you can meet all sorts of small group leaders out here. They will help you take the next step in engaging in a small group. Today, I'm focusing on that. Now, what I wanna tell you is you know the heart of this church. The heart of this church is to get you connected to Jesus one day at a time in your word, receiving manna from heaven, being filled up so that then you can go get in community and bring that to the community, discuss that in the community, bring the sorts of issues that you're walking through in life, and next thing you know, that combination of individual intimacy and being surrounded is, is the pathway to growth. Can we all agree on that? Yeah. But today, I'm not gonna hit on the secret place. I'm not gonna talk about self-feeding. I wanna talk today about the idea of growing in community. The second thing is we need to be giving. Growing, giving, and going is the recipe for growth, it's the recipe for getting in the game here at Love Church. It's how you get all in with what God is doing here. Now, what I wanna say to everybody in this place today is this. You are all at different seasons of your life. So Matt's next step might look different than your next step in the back. Cap's next step with a bunch of little kids running around might look different than you that's the empty, empty nester. I don't know, but there's a range of people in this place in different seasons and places. So that's why you need to say, God, what are you inviting me into in this season? In this season, what is the invitation? So let's look at this, this first piece of growing. When I think about growing, I like to say this, that the atmosphere you permit decides the product you produce. You're becoming like those that you do life with. It's just the truth. We walk like, act like, talk like those that we hang around. That's why there's even just a, with our preaching team, our preaching team, the personalities are so different. Can we agree? But there's a lot of, there's a lot of common language that comes out. Why is that? Because there's power in language. There's just, we're, we're around each other. There's a culture of this church. There's a language of the house. That's what happens. And to prove my point, I'll share with you, I've got two boys, one's six, that's Judah, my youngest, Royce, is two. 
Recently, Judah, when he's been getting out of line and kind of stirring trouble up, and I'm like, yo, dude, what are you doing? And I confront him on it. His excuse, and I'm calling it an excuse because it's an excuse, <laughs> is I'm just trying to be funny. You ever heard that one before? So he's been saying this you know, over and over again, and it just makes me frustrated if I'm really honest. Well, the other day, Royce was being a little bonehead himself, and so I called him to the carpet on it. He's my little two-year-old. And as soon as I tried to confront him and address him, he looked at me and he said, I'm just trying to be funny. I'm like, I've heard that one before. <laughs> Judah's starting to rub off on you. It makes me think of what Paul said when he said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. There's this principle of imitation all throughout scripture. I really believe that that's why Jesus invited 12 disciples to walk with him closely through life because basically what Jesus was saying is imitate me. Imitate me. That's what apprenticeship is. It's imitation. That's why we talk about the discipleship journey looking like I do, you watch, then I do, you do, then you do and I watch, then you do and I step away. There's a process to it. Jesus didn't just turn the keys loose to them in, in Matthew chapter 28 after spending one day with them. No, he walked with them for like two and a half, three years of investment, of modeling it before he ever sent them out. So how's your relational soil? Because if you reject the invitation that God is inviting all of us into in this season to get surrounded in community, it will keep you in spiritual kindergarten for the rest of your walk. Because there's a, there's a component to maturity that only happens in the midst of community. Because guess what? You can get all the truth in the world in isolation, but there's only one way to learn how to love and be loved, and it's in community. Last time I checked, God said to love him supremely and love people supernaturally. How do we grow in that command if we're disconnected from community? So I want you to think about how is your relational community? What's feeding your soul? Because you're becoming like the community that you run with. And you're living in denial if you don't think you're a part of a community. Maybe you haven't plugged in here at Love Church and community. You're a part of a community. You've got a friend group. You've got people at the office, people at the gym. I don't know what the case is for you, but you've got community. And I was reminded of the differences in relational soil the other day when I looked out my backyard. You're like, what are you talking about, dude? Well, we moved into this home. Long story short, we're, we were trying to have a chemical-free yard, and so we didn't spray the yard. And next thing you know, my wife, or my, no, my wife, it was her decision. I'll just blame it on her. Sorry, babe. <laughs> I was being a good husband and walking in alignment with her request. And all of a sudden, 65, 70% of my yard was covered in foxtail. So, okay, confession. The whole idealism, that's probably what I struggle with. I'm like a perfectionist. I just like things in order. And I mean, every day I'm having to get up and just like twitch, man, like looking at my yard. <laughs> this whole summer I've had to mow my yard two days a week just to keep it under control. Like, come on, dude, everybody in the neighborhood's yard is on point. And I respect that. And I'm like, I'm the one knucklehead in the whole neighborhood that's just, am I, is the HOA gonna come knocking on my door or what's the deal here? So I'm looking out my backyard and I see like all these foxtail, but simultaneously we planted a garden. So there's this, in the back of this yard that's covered with all these foxtail, you've got this garden. And man, my kids back in like May or June put these seeds in this awesome soil and here we are in August and September, and I was telling Matt this week, like there's nothing more cool than when you sit at the dinner table and you're enjoying the vegetables that come from a seed that you sowed months prior. Like how cool is that? So I look out and I see this garden that's just like all the plants are, and the onions are sprouting up and tomatoes and these green bell peppers. And it's like producing food that's going on our table. It's all this life is springing up. And then I look out in the yard and there's all these weeds springing up. And I'm like, well, what's the difference there? It's the soil. 
Do you see the importance of your relational soil in your life? So if you're gonna be a growing Christian, if you wanna continue to go on this journey of spiritual matur maturity, spiritual formation, it's gonna require you to engage in a group. I remember when this happened in my life. I, in 2006, in that season of loneliness, I was standing out at practice and next thing you know, I felt a tap on the shoulder. This guy by the name of David Ray, who was an upperclassman, just looked at me and said, yo, like, do you wanna come with me to this Bible study that I go to? I was in a season where I was spiraling downward. My, my world was becoming unraveled. My identity was, I didn't know who I was. Felt like I was in a dark season. I'm like, you know what? Yeah, I'll show up with you. So on Wednesday night, I roll into the team doctor's house, Dr. Greenwald. There's this group of guys and there's this dessert. And I'm like, who's this guy? I've never, I've never even like, this guy's like actually speaking my language. Like I can actually connect with this guy. He seems like a normal guy. He's a doctor. He's got a wife and children and just a cool dude. And man, this dessert is amazing. Next thing you know, he cracks open the Bible and we start discussing the Bible. And I had never experienced what the, the, the Bible describes as koinonia. Acts 2, 42 through 47, which is where we get our small group vision, which I encourage you with homework, go read that. That's what, that's what biblical community should look like. Just so you know, our heart is that the church would never get bigger than four to 14. And when you are in community four to 14, you can actually carry out the community that we read about in Acts 2, 42. So this word fellowship in the Greek is called koinonia. This was the first time I'd ex ever experienced anything like this. And I didn't even know it, but the Holy Spirit was drawing me to Jesus through community, through a small group. I hadn't even surrendered to Christ, yet I kept coming back week after week. And there were even some Wednesdays I would come into Bible study and walk out and go straight to the clubs and do my thing. But God was drawing me. He was doing something in my life. And to watch these men get vulnerable and to be in an environment where there was accountability, I started to come to this convergence where I needed to make a decision. And a year after I engaged in that community, I was sitting in a Hollywood video parking lot with an upperclassman who was also a part of that community. He shares the gospel and I come to Christ in a Hollywood video parking lot in Lames, Iowa. So it all goes back to being surrounded in what? Community, that was 14 years ago. There has not been a season of my walk with Christ where I have not been engaged in a small group since that time 14 years ago. So I'm here to tell you that, that give it a shot, fall in love with the process. Some of you gave your whole life to the enemy and he wrecked it and you're giving God a month and because he doesn't move in a month, you're wanting to run away. I'm here to say, stay in the game, fall in love with the process. This is just a discipline that will be part of my life. Just like you and I can't go to the gym today, get a good lift in, stand in the mirror and see our body change. But if you do that for 365 days, I promise you when you stare in the mirror, you're gonna look a little different. I can tell you 14 years later after being engaged in a small group, I would not be on this platform right now if I didn't have a group of men surrounding me for 14 years straight. It's just the facts. So if you wanna get in the game, if you wanna get off the sideline and get into the game and start growing, it's gonna require you to get uncomfortable and to embrace community, to get vulnerable and invite accountability into your life. And I wanna encourage you today, reject the facade, take off the mask. The communities in this church, they're safe places. They're not perfect places, but they're safe places where you can be authentic. And if you're offended, I wanna encourage you, go to that person, have the conversation. That's what healthy community looks like. That's the dynamic of what God has invited us into. But if we will embrace it, we will be a growing people. We'll be a discipling people. And before you know it, this church will continue to multiply and remain healthy. We will not just be wide, but we will be deep. And the answer to that request is you and I saying yes to what Jesus has for us. Are you ready to rise up and disciple the next generation? A growing people, a growing people. The second thing it's gonna require is for us to be a giving people, a giving people. I love this because in Matthew chapter 10, you'll see this, Jesus 
So like I just reminded you, here's what's interesting. This is the beauty too of, of, of Jesus is, so you come here on a Sunday and you receive. And that's great. And God, this is awesome. Like God's word is alive. It's active. This is a place to receive, to be charged up, to be encouraged, to be equipped. This is a form of discipleship. The word of God is being preached right now and taught. This is a component. You go to a small group, you receive, you're, you're, you're around the word of God. And yes, people are coming and contributing and giving. But the next piece to this thing that, that requires a new level of sacrifice is this idea of giving. And in Matthew chapter 10, I'm not gonna read all the scripture, but there comes a point in the ministry where Jesus brings these disciples together. He's investing in them. He's modeling for them. And then he's like, yo, the time has come. I need to send you out. And so he says this to him. I love this. It says this, give as freely as you have received. In other words, you have freely received. And so now I'm asking you to freely give. So I want to illustrate this. Matt, can you come up here real quick? Yeah, come on, all the way up here on the stage. So I want you to stand over here. Actually, stand right here front and center. And I want you to put your hands out. And this is, put your hands out in a posture of receiving. So this is ultimately the question and the picture that I want you to see. When I talk about this idea of giving is, we, we got to first recognize who the ultimate giver is. Like, did you wake up this morning and tell yourself to breathe? Well, I mean, you're breathing and you're making the choice to breathe, but that breath comes from somewhere. How about the food on your table or the vehicle you drove here or the job that you have or the time that you and I have been given today or the talents and the gifting, the filmmaking ability, the ability to preach, the ability to coach, lead a family, the ability to play ball, Come on, hospitality and customer service. My man right here, just always serving it up. Who do those gifts come from? Who's the good gift giver? It's first God. And here's what he does is he pour. Oh, who loves some Twix, baby? Yes. So God puts, puts some gifts in our hands. And here's the deal. Here's what most of us do, especially in Western culture is we close our fists. See, this is a posture of, of being greedy. But what God has invited you and I into is a posture of gratitude. And when we recognize who our gift giver is, it allows us to stay in a place of open-handedness where we live a life of generosity. Why? Because we recognize that we serve a generous God. So many of us are living with a scarcity mindset. And so when we've been given these gifts, we just hold tightly onto them as if we're never gonna lose them. The problem is, is when your hands are like this, you can't receive what God wants to give you. So now your life looks more like a lake when you're called to be more like a river. So what it looks like to be a river, I want you to open your hands up, is God is now pouring down and now you get to distribute. Raise your hand if you like some Twix in here today. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. Yes, God is blessing Matt and Matt is just a funnel. He's a river, oh my goodness. Oh, oh, you're running out because you're so generous. Here, I'm gonna give you some more. Yes, from heaven. Yes, oh my goodness, you're being faithful with little. Oh, you're being faithful with little, so now I can trust you with much. Yes, much. So just keep flowing. Keep being a good steward. All right, go ahead and take a seat. Yeah, go ahead and toss it all out there. Give it up for MJ as he heads off the stage. Do you see the picture? Do you see the picture? So, so how are you and I stewarding our time, our talent, our treasure? Are we living lives of constant generosity? Or are we closed off? Do we look more like a lake or more like a river? I think there's a reason why, you know, there's 52,000 storage facilities worldwide and 46,000 of them are in the U.S. See, we love our stuff. And let me just be very clear. There's nothing wrong 
with your stuff. God has given you all things richly to enjoy, but are you being a good steward of what he's given you to build the kingdom of God? Are you storing up treasure in heaven or treasure on earth? Last time I checked, we've never seen a U-Haul behind a hearse. But so many of us live our lives that way, me included. I like stuff. I think about stuff. I think about getting more. But I'm fully alive when I'm actually giving, when I'm walking in generosity, because the key to living is giving. Is anybody with me? There is joy and peace and purpose that comes when we take what God has given us and we freely give it away. And that's the invitation that God is giving you and I. He says this, where your treasure is, your heart will be there also. So God doesn't need your finances or your service to build his kingdom. He could do it, but he lets you be a part of it. He invites you to be a part of it. And oftentimes the way to your heart is through your checkbook. So y'all are just mad at the church. Like they just want the money. No, listen, we don't even pass plates here. We don't want your money, but God is saying, do you want to be a part of something bigger than yourself? Do you want to break the yoke and the chain of the scarcity mindset of this mentality of being a lake? The easiest way to do that is to say, God, I'm going to put you first in this area. That's why we read about the tithe. The tithe is the first 10%. My wife and I have been doing this for years. So when we get paid, the first thing that goes out is, man, we're giving back to God and what he's building. We want to be part of the local church, whether I'm a part of it or not. There's one thing that Jesus said he's building and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And it isn't my side business. It's the local church. It's his plan A for humanity. He's inviting us into this and he's saying, come be a part of this. And here's the deal. You might be challenged by this today saying, man, I need to take a step in this area. And I just don't know if overnight I can begin trusting God with 10%. Well, what's the next step? We're all in process. What's the next step? Or maybe you've been in a group, you've been surrounded, you're, man, you're just like, you know, you're faithful, available, and teach, teachable, and you just feel like a fat Christian, and you're just getting filled up, and now it's time to give out. It's time to serve. It's time to sacrifice some time and get on a team or go serve and love kids or hop on a camera. Use your gifts, man, because to, to, here's the deal. Your service here isn't going to save you, but it might save somebody else. Because I've heard time and time again, people walk through the front doors and receive a hug and they say that's when they experience the love of God for the very first time. So before the preacher ever even opened his mouth, it's your faithful service at the front door that opened the door for them to receive God's love. Can we praise him in this place today? We want to be a growing people. We want to be a giving people. And the final thing is we need to be a going people. I want to finish with this. You guys already know this, Matthew 28. Jesus says, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I love this. Go therefore can be basically translated as you're going. And so I love this because our, our heart at this church for love out loud is that you and I would occupy the space and place that God has already placed us. So check this out in a couple weeks, shout out to the love out loud team. There's this cool thing happening in our city called city serve. And we can't wait to be a part of it. We're locking arms with within reach and we're unleashing on compassionate love, compassionate love, not uncompassionate. We are releasing compassionate love on our city and it's a citywide outreach and we want you to jump in and be a part of this but can I tell you the most effective way that you and I can love out loud is to love our neighbor the person next to us in the cubicle the client that we're already working with our locker mate at school the person in our community the parent that's on my kids sports team like where has God already placed you And are you willing and available? As we look at Jesus's life, one of the coolest things is he was willing to be interrupted. So many of us are serving our schedules rather than the Savior. But this week, are you willing just wherever you go to say, God, I submit my schedule to you. 
And you might call me to have this conversation or go love on this person. Or I've got a friend named CJ who's been waking up in the morning and his prayer has been, God, show me a map of where you want me to go. And God's been putting like crazy things on his mind. Like I need you to go to this fire department and then I need you to drive to this office. And I'm like, that is radical obedience saying, God, I want to be used of you to love my city, to see people come to know you. So if we're going to get in the game, if we're going to get off the sidelines, if we're going to throw down the popcorn and stop being fans and we're going to actually make a difference, it's going to require us to be growing, to get in community, to be giving and to be going. Come on, church. He doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the call. You and I need to answer the call. There's a young man that recently did, and I'm going to finish with this. It's one thing to preach it but I want you to see a real life story of someone that said yes to getting in community. Let's turn our attention to the screen as we close. (laughs) Hi, my name is Trey Tiggs, and this is my mortal life story. I recently moved to Omaha in August of 2021, and I was looking for a church home, so I, Hashtag churches in Omaha, and I came across Love Church. So I decided to go, and that day, OC was preaching about being surrounded by faith-filled friends, and that's what I was looking for prior to moving to Omaha, and I found it that day moving forward. So following that message that OC preached about, I hit him up on Instagram that night and just told him how much I was encouraged and how I wanted to get plugged in small groups because that's what I was looking for. And that next Sunday, I met him. He uh, introduced me to some small group leaders, Sam, Nick, and Britton, and Easton, and that was small group launch, so I got plugged in ASAP. So my first experience going to Love Church, small group, um, I was nervous, honestly. I didn't know like, what I was getting myself into. I didn't know any of these people, as so I was shy. I didn't say a word, but as time went on, I got comfortable, and I was able to connect with others and share my story. What I love most about small groups is having that community that holds me um, accountable for the weekly readings. And small groups has just been a place where, it's just been a safe place for me to where I can go and just share what it is on my heart and mind with others and not be judged. Not only do we have small groups, but we love to get out in the community and play spike ball, volleyball, have bonfires and just connect with other small groups and just get to know each other and love on each other. If you're not surrounded with a small group, I encourage that you get plugged in so that you can experience God's best for your life. So go ahead and stand with me. As I pray to close, I want you to, I want you to connect, connect to this moment here because I think Trey said it better than I could. And what's interesting is Trey Tiggs isn't even in the mix any longer. He's since moved to Michigan in the last month. And here's the interesting thing is I think about this young man that was here for about a year. And I think about the, 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 the lives that he touched. And I remember I was, I was blown away when they did a going away party for this young man. And I pull up and there are groves of people like leaving this party. I got there kind of late. And I was just thinking, look at how many, how many people have been touched by Trey Tiggs in one year's time frame. And you heard it. What did he say? He showed up to the group and he didn't even say anything. He was a little bit intimidated. But he said, yes, Lord. And then he got engaged in, in love kids. And the next thing you know, God is using him in this community to build authentic, meaningful relationships. And he's touched many lives. I'm just, I'm looking around the, the room and seeing a bunch of heads nod because if you knew Trey Tiggs, you were touched by his spirit. Am I right? And this is God's heart for all of us in this place. And I just believe It's so funny that I was preaching a message called faith-filled friends, and I'm just believing that God wants to surround you with some faith-filled friends. And the same challenge that he took when I was preaching that message is the same challenge that you need to take. I'm believing in this auditorium there are some more Trey Tiggs 
that need to engage in a group so that God can write a story in your life like Trey Kids. Come on. Can we thank God? Lord, we just thank you. We thank you that that's your heart for this church. That's your heart for us, is you long for us to be engaged. You want us to get in the game. You, you don't necessarily want something from us. You want to deposit something in us, God. You want to you want to surround us. You want to experience a new level of vulnerability and empathy and accountability and growth. You want us to experience the joy and purpose that comes when we have the opportunity to partner with you in generosity. Give back. Lord, you, your word declares that you gave your, of your one and only son. So you gave so that we could give. And now you invite us to go on mission. You invite us into purpose and calling and destiny. And I pray that over the body of Christ today that whatever the meaningful next step is that they need to take, that they would stretch, that they would lean into that today. Whether they're in this auditorium, join us online or wherever they're at in the world, God, I pray that they would know in this moment that every ear under my voice would know, God, that you have a great plan for their life, that you wanna use them. Jesus, that you wanna walk with them, that you will never leave them nor forsake them, and that you who begins a good work in us will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. I pray that if they believed anything other than that, that today that lie would be tossed out and today they would hold on to purpose, today they would walk in your best plan, that they would not grow weary in doing good for at the proper time they will reap a harvest if they do not give up. God, would you give us staying power? Would you give us conviction? Would you call us to raise up the next generation? In Jesus' name. Now, before I say amen, I recognize that a room this size, there's some of you that are like, man, that sounds awesome. I, I want to live a life like that. I want, I want, I believe there's more to life and I want to experience God's best for my life. Or maybe you don't even think God could do that in your life. Maybe there's so much guilt and shame or hopelessness. But I'm here to tell you today that I don't, Wherever you're at on, on that graphic, the first step in this whole thing is, is the moment of surrender. We've gotta to come to this place of surrender, surrendering and receiving the free gift. See, in our culture, there's so many of us that think that we've gotta get right with God by showing up to church, reading our Bible, doing all these things. It's just like I told you earlier, God didn't come to make bad people good, he came to make dead people alive. You and I, the Bible says, we are dead in our sin. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And a good judge will find us guilty. But a loving judge sends his one and only son to pay our penalty. So Jesus went to the cross to pay you and I's debt, a debt that we could never pay. And he paid it with his blood. They put him in a grave and three days later, he cracked the grave proving who he is. And now he sends out his spirit and he says, receive my grace. Come walk with me, come follow me, just like he did to Peter, just like he did to John. And I believe he's doing it to someone here today. He's saying, come follow me. All you gotta do is get out of your seat and make your way forward. And God says this, that if you'll acknowledge me before man, I will acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. There's a moment of faith that needs to erupt in your heart today to believe in this by faith. And so I'm just praying that, that God is gonna release you from your street. As the band plays, just make your way forward and I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. The prayer is super simple. It'll be an opportunity for you to connect with God and your life will never be the same. You will walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but you can fear no evil from this day forward because you know who will go with you. Life might not get easier, but I promise you, my worst days with God are better than my best days without him. And I want you to receive that today. So band, go ahead and play. If that's you, I want you to make your way forward in the house of God. I love 
your boldness and your courage. And it reminds me of the parables that we read about Jesus going after the one. And all of this today was for you. And I also wanna make this invitation, if you're joining us online right now, you can pray this prayer as well, but I'm gonna lead you in a prayer and this is just you connecting with Jesus. So if you're ready, repeat this prayer after me and say, Lord God, I invite you inside to be my God, to be my savior, and to be my friend. Forgive me of my sin, for today I'm choosing to receive your forgiveness. Thank you for dying on the cross and raising from the grave. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to walk this out one day at a time. In Jesus' name, amen. We've got a team that just wants to give you a Bible and pray for you, so go ahead and head this way. Church, come on, let's give it up for this incredible woman. So awesome. Hey, this month, let's get in the game. Let's be a growing people, a giving people, and a going people. Love you, church. Come on. Hey, come on. Can we give God some praise? Can we honor Pastor O.C.? Thank you so much, bro. Amazing work. So powerful. Hey, before we head out, I want to give this challenge just to the people online first. Hold tight. I'm going to give you a message, too, in the auditorium, too. But for those online, talking about small groups, talking about jumping into community, we don't want you to feel like you're alienated from that message, especially if you're not in the Omaha area. And so what we're doing in this season is we're opening up the Love Church Online Community Facebook group, and we'd love for you to hop in on that. There's gonna be a link in the chat, so please click that link, join the group, we'll see you there. But for those in the auditorium, let's take this challenge seriously. There's, there's a step deeper for all of us today, and especially for those who are not in a small group yet. So as you're leaving the auditorium, please stop by the connect table and just see what's available, amen? So I'm gonna pray for us and then you guys are gonna be excused, but Lord, we just, uh, we thank you. We thank you for what you deposited in us this morning. And we don't wanna leave here unchanged. We wanna be transformed, we wanna grow. I love the, the verbiage that, that OC gave us. We wanna grow, we wanna continue to give, and we wanna go and be a blessing to our community. Lead us by your spirit to do that today and this week. In Jesus' name, amen. You're excused. God bless you, everybody. Thanks so much.